to warm up my voice. Okay. I forgot to warm up my voice. Well, no, 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 no. Thanks. I feel quite conspicuous. Sorry? It's fantastic to see you all in the audience to hear our keynote speaker, our, our first keynote speaker for the conference. It gives me enormous pleasure to introduce Professor Laura Mosley. When I came back to Australia um, uh, oh, about uh, more than 10 years ago now, um, I went to my first physiotherapy con uh, conference. And I felt like a fish, fish out of water. And uh, uh, I went to a session which had this Lorimer Mosley person in there. And uh, he got up on stage and told this story <laughs> in such a way that there you would, couldn't hear a pin drop because he was so engaging, so charismatic. And I have to say, it made me think, wow. What a fantastic place Australia is. Why did I ever go away? <laughs> so I, I have been wanting to bring Lorimer Mosley to Canberra to speak for a long time. And last, the last physiotherapy conference I went to, I asked him whether he'd be keen to come, come to Canberra, and he said, yes, he would. I thought, what a great bloke, isn't he fantastic? And, uh, and to come to Canberra in winter, oh, who'd do that? But um, it, it, he told me today that he's a Canberra boy. <laughs> so he's just come home. <laughs> so uh, there's a whole blurb about Lorimer here in your keynote speakers uh, list on your app, or actually I, I'm not sure you'll have this, but Lorimer is a, a very, very well-known, famous man, I would say, <laughs> though he would be going, oh, shucks, but he is. <laughs> so he's the Professor of Clinical Neurosciences at the University of South Australia and Senior Principal Research Fellow at Neuroscience Research Australia. So he's a, he's a local boy made good, definitely. <laughs> um, and he leads the Body Mind Research Group, um, which investigates the role of the brain and mind in chronic pain. Um, he has done uh, the most fantastic TED Talk. So if you get a chance to look at that, if you want to, if you want to see Lorimer again, go online, see his TED Talk. Thousands and thousands of likes, thumbs up. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Lorimer Mosley. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, that's quite an intimidating introduction, actually. Uh, <laughs> You might notice, if anyone's aware, that I'm wearing the colours of Bell South Junior Football Club, <laughs> Bell Connor United, where I was very proud playing sweeper up the back there. Uh, yeah, so thank you for inviting me back to Canberra. Uh, I'm not going to do a tour. I came back with my family last time I came and showed them my school, Hawker Primary, which I remember had this, this tunnel between Unit 3 and Unit 4, I think it was which you had to take a packed lunch to get through. It was so long. And then when I saw it again a couple of years ago, it, it was literally like from here to there away. <laughs> I thought, you know, obviously that's amazing, but actually that is amazing. Uh, and, and those are the sort of experiences that really get me quite excited. Not really anything to do with pain, but everything to do with perception and memory and storage of information. And I'm really fascinated by how we store information. Relevant to that is that, that we are having this meeting uh, on the land of the Ngunnawal Nation, who have been telling stories here for at least 20,000 years, according to paintings near Thawa, and probably well beyond that. And it's a real privilege for me to come and tell my stories on their land, and I, I pay my respect to, to the Ngunnawal Nation. I also uh, take very seriously conflicts of interest. 
Now, normally when you put up conflicts of interest slides, you do this. You say, uh, these are my conflicts. <laughs> but I think it's really useful for you to take note of my conflicts of interest because this is how the brain works. You, you can't remove cues when you make decisions. You just really hope they're not as influential as you'd like them to be. So it's in my interests uh, to make you want to buy something that I get money from. <laughs> and the most relevant thing there are books that I've written, uh, but I get research support from people including the devil, you might notice here. <laughs> uh, I, I help out workers' compensation boards in Australia and Europe and in North America. Uh, and these are all things that are relevant to my decision making and as a scientist decision making is everything because we end up communicating to the rest of the world what it is we've found uh, and that's exactly what I'm doing now. So for the next uh, 50 minutes just be aware of the conflicts of interest that I, I bring to the table. So if anyone's not familiar with this and I imagine that many of you are otherwise this would be the session you duck out for but just in case you're not, persistent pain is not a trivial issue in the world, uh, by no means. It's a massive burden. This was a paper that is remarkable for two reasons. One is that it covers the, the burden of health conditions throughout the world. The other is it has a bloody lot of authors. <laughs> They're all the authors, isn't that amazing? I wonder if really you can justify this person here <laughs> Maria, Maria Lone, what did she really do to this? I don't know. I don't know if you're here, Maria. I don't know who Maria is. I just picked that out not quite at random because there were cues that were influencing me, clearly, of some description. This is the study. It's a, it's a massive study. It's a very influential paper. They come up with something like this, and I just want to draw your attention to the top of the list of the world's most burdensome health conditions. And hopefully you can see... Sorry about that, I don't know why I did that. That's an interesting thing, isn't it? But these are, these are some of the top ranked conditions. So we've got low back pain at, at one in the world, neck pain at four, other musculoskeletal disorders. Now, that, the burden of that won't just be pain, but normally it's pain that stops you doing things. And stiffness, and I'll talk about that briefly later. Migraine and OA. And again, with OA, it's pain. We've just heard from Angie, it's, it's pain. People turn up for treatment, for pain. In my clinical experience, I've never had a patient turn up and say, I've been really looking forward to seeing you because my interleukin-4 is slightly upregulated. <laughs> no one says that. I say, why are you here? Well, my HPA axis, just a little bit steeper curve than usual. No, they say, I'm hurting. I'm in pain. And I don't want to be in pain anymore. And it's the pain that's motivated me to come and see you to get help. So as far as that metric is concerned, I reckon these are amazing stats. I just wish that all the grant review panels agreed uh, when you put these stats in your grants. But low back pain exerts 11% of the total worldwide disease burden. That's quite remarkable, really. Uh, particularly when we think about the worldwide disease burden, this is in terms of years lived with disability and, and costs of lost productivity. Cardiovascular and circulatory problems, 3%. Endocrine disorders, e.g. diabetes, 2%. So this is not a trivial matter. Now, I don't, I don't want to be seen as the evangelist saying, forget cancer, forget diabetes. That, that's not what I believe. But what I believe is that we, we're in trouble with this burden and we need a better way to reduce it. Uh, and that excites me as a, as a scientist. Most of the burden of back pain, neck pain, uh, osteoarthritic pain, is exerted by those who have had it for more than three to six months, and we call that persistent pain or chronic pain. Uh, I'm moving away from the idea of chronic pain as a label because a lot of people who are not in, in the hood, in the sort of health space, understand chronic to mean really bad, not long-standing. So we tend to use persistent pain as a phrase rather than chronic pain as a result. So how does pain biology actually affect patient care? And I want to convince you that it really does, but I want to convince you that every single clinical interaction you have is a complex biological event going on. 
And, and these studies really motivated me, I think, to continue on as a physiotherapist when I, when I graduated. When I first graduated, I did not want to be a physiotherapist. My final clinical placement was so boring, I would have rather shaved my corneas off with a blunt razor. <laughs> it was horrible. So I said, I'm never being a physiotherapist. But I ran out of money about six months later, and I started work. <laughs> and, and it was great, actually. It was a great, great job to get. But these are data. I've put them together. But most of the data I'll tell you about now come from a range of studies uh, out of a group broadly led by Braithwaite and Cooper. And if it was an analgesic study, you could give someone a placebo or an aspirin. The aspirin will be more effective, but the placebo has a response. And that's probably not surprising to anyone. If you do nothing, you'll have a response. That might be marginally surprising, particularly if you're a sufferer. And the statistics say that 20 of you are suffering from persistent pain, at least 20 of you, probably more. But if you have a clinical interaction and you do nothing, there will be pain relief as a mean outcome of that interaction. But if you get an aspirin and you brand it, it's a better analgesic. Cool. It's starting to become quite cool, I think. If you brand the placebo, you get a better response than if you just gave them a placebo. So make sure you put the placebo in the branded box. So Braithwaite and Cooper start to divide up all these analgesic effects of things and they can start to look for consistencies across that and this is the sort of idea they came up with that in any interaction you'll have a natural history, this is what was going to happen anyway. Uh, the act of taking a pill has an effect. Just think about that for a moment, think how remarkable that is. The act of taking a pill is changing pain. There is a brand effect and there is a drug effect. And this is the thing that we spend all the money on from a research perspective, f trying to find a better drug effect. I'm really interested also in trying to find a better everything else effect. So this slide is not meant for you to read, it's just meant to tell you there is a bucket load of research looking at the effects of inert interventions on real life symptoms and signs. Most of it's on symptoms, feelings, but also on some signs. And for example, this line here suggests, uh, the suggestion is based on 416 RCTs. So each of these lines is a, is a big group of RCTs. So the point of this slide is to say, this is a lot of research on this. It comes up with statements like this, that subcutaneous injections of a molecule that does nothing has a, a bigger effect than swallowing the molecule. That's probably not very surprising, but if we put it into Braithwaite and Cooper's model here, we would just say that the act of having an injection is more analgesic than the act of taking a pill. Uh, clearly, there's different pharmacokinetics from different pathways in and all of that, but these, these, the sentiment of this stands really, really strongly. Probably no one's uh, very in, uh, surprised by this, but I, I was quite impressed uh, from one of the talks this morning about how confident consultants are in their ability to do things compared to junior doctors. And I wonder if that's not just that they're better, but that part of the, the, the cue building is relating to confidence and that has a, has a, a snowball effect. I really like that idea. Well, let's take this scenario. So let's take patient A and patient B and let's say they do exactly the same thing and they have that effect. So what's going on? Let's say these are the two clinicians. <laughs> now, I just plucked these off the internet. This is, uh, this is a very well-respected president of the Australian Pain Society, Jess Fildewin. Uh, this, I don't know, this was on YouTube. And <laughs> They get two different responses. Now, we would be tempted then to say, oh, yeah, no problem. Uh, we've got a treatment effect because the reality is in chronic pain, most of our treatments don't have much of an effect of the active intervention. There's a natural history, and then we'll call the rest placebo. Uh, now, I'm on the record of suggesting in the British Medical Journal that the term placebo, the idea is a daft idea, placebo effect, because it's an effect caused by nothing and nothing can't have an effect. So the sentence makes no sense to me. I'm very happy to call things placebos, and it's another way of saying it's something that doesn't have a molecule of biological 
activation. But what we're talking about here, I think, is not really an effect. It's a whole bunch of effects that we can understand better than we do. For example, <laughs> the effect of the dashing good looks of uh, Dr. Spilderwin, for example, his extensive vocabulary <laughs> and eloquence. <laughs> I, uh, I ride a scooter around at home and uh, I always, whenever I see a patient, I have my scooter. It's a very high quality scooter. It's made by micro scooters. If you've got a kid, you, you probably at one stage your kids had one of those three wheel scooters that they're a micro. Micro is the best scooter brand. But it doesn't go down very well with patients. They go, is that, is that yours? I'd rather see the guy with the Mercedes keys. And I love it when some consultants turn up and nonchalantly leave the keys on the table next to you and it's got a Mercedes and a BMW key on it. <laughs> Pretentious. <laughs> Fashion sense, for example. And all of these things sound really facetious, but all of these things have been the subject of a randomised controlled trial that showed an effect. Uh, an exception to that is a study that we've just had accepted in patient education and counselling that shows that if, if a physiotherapist is dressed up in a tie and jacket for a treatment, they're not perceived as any more credible than the physiotherapist in active wear. <laughs> <laughs> Laugh if you've seen the YouTube. You know the YouTube clip? I'd like to see that. Treating my patient in my active wear. <laughs> But this is the big kahuna for me. I reckon this is such a special study. It was a double-blind, placebo-controlled study uh, of fentanyl after wisdom teeth removal. Fentanyl is a powerful analgesic. But what they did is trick the dentists in this study. And here's what they did. They told half the dentists, sorry, we've run out of fentanyl. It's a mistake. It's an administrative error. You're going to be injecting placebo. But don't let the patient know. And told the other 50% of dentist the truth. There was a 50% chance. Now there was a 50% chance for both. Double blinded. I always love the idea of a dentist being blinded. <laughs> like that's a really intimidating situation. <laughs> You're there going, Orma, Orma. <laughs> so this was the result. This was what happened when people got an injection of placebo. If the dentist thought there was no chance they could be delivering fentanyl, pain got worse by three points. If they thought there was a 50% chance, pain got better by two points on average. And the groovy bit, I reckon, is they got uh, videos, they filmed some of these interactions and showed them to an independent person and said, which group do you think the dentist is in? Couldn't pick it. Could not pick which group the dentist is in but something is happening between the dentist and the patient that reduces pain by, by five points on a 10-point scale. Now, I'm putting oomph, so remember there's a conflict of interest here. I want you to believe what I believe. So it may not be that profound, but it's an effect. It's clearly an effect that can't be detected from a, by an outsider. So what sort of non-nociceptive cues modulate pain? We tend to think that pain is all about the messages coming from the body. Well, our group's uh, really interested in this. Here's a study that triggered a, a series of experiments in our group and a few other groups uh, where we simultaneously delivered a very cold stimulus to supposedly normal healthy volunteers. Now, I always do that because these people are volunteering for pain experiments. So they're clearly not normal people, right? <laughs> like you can just to see what Canberra's like now that I've been gone for a long time. Uh, let's say you were walking down the street and you saw a little sign saying, participants wanted for pain experiment. <laughs> who, who rings the number? <laughs> Almost no one, but some people will. And, and you know, one of our staff will say, well, you'll come in, you'll fill out some questionnaires. And then we put a, a sort of like a swimming cap on your head with lots of electrodes on it. It's called an EEG, and then we will pluck the skin with a, with a, a pin to make it bleed a little bit, just, just 64 points, that's all we do. <laughs> uh, and then we'll give you an injection of very salty water into the muscles of your pelvic floor. <laughs> now, about 50% chance that you'll lose control of your bowel, but we'll have a lot of green sheets. <laughs> so who is still there saying, yep, I'm in? 
it's not until we give them the very enticing, this was done in the UK, this study, five pounds book voucher <laughs> in exchange for that. So when we end up with a paper that says the effect of experimentally induced pain on muscle activation in the pelvis in healthy, normal adults, what we should really say is the effect of injecting salty water into the muscles of the pelvic floor in psychologically questionable, <laughs> poverty-stricken students whose grades are not quite as good as they'd like them to be. This is what we did, a very cold stimulus and either a, a red light or a blue light that was, that was presented at exactly the same time. And we asked them a range of questions, but this was the one we were most interested in, and that is, how much does it hurt? What's your pain in response to that? Now, the noxious stimulus is always the same here. But if they see a red light, hopefully you can tell these are individual participants. It hurts more than if they see a blue light. There are some exceptions. This person here and this person here, they are idiots. <laughs> <laughs> They're not picking up on the cues that are giving them important information. This is a study done by uh, Dan Harvey as part of his PhD where we are interested in whether we could shift pain thresholds just by pairing a painful stimulus with a tactile stimulus at a certain location. Try to picture that we're moving towards some sort of ecological validity, some sort of real life situation there. So we're a fair way away from it, but that's where we're moving. This was the setup. Uh, so these are the the stimuli that are, are going to hurt, these are the stimuli that are going to be associated with either intense painful st stimulus or a non-painful stimulus. So in Pavlov's dogs, we are, we're doing an equivalent of ringing a bell to get them to produce saliva. What we're doing is delivering a tactile stimulus and then a big noxious stimulus to see if that ends up in a situation where the tactile stimulus modulates future stimuli. Simple classical conditioning experiment. Uh, this just shows that the, the experiences were different if you had uh, a painful from a non-painful stimulus. Not very surprising, really. These differences here show that we have conditioned pain. So we've changed the pain that's evoked by our subsequent stimulus, either to take it up or to take it down, according to the simultaneous, that's what this shows, effectively simultaneous presentation of the stimuli. So this is not an expectation effect. This is not a, a predictive scenario. So if it, there's any Bayes thinkers among you, we can't really explain this by an expectation, but we can explain it by a Q combination. If you're into Bayes theory, that's how we would make sense of this. This is a study, uh, now we're moving towards the back, we're getting a bit more uh, valid again, slightly different study looking at if we can change pain threshold instead of the pain that is evoked. This is done by Tori Madden for her PhD. Uh, the fact that these are in a different location tells us, yes, we can. This is conditioned reduction of pain threshold. So things that didn't hurt before now hurt. So we're hitting some threshold in the brain. And it's interesting to me, well, what is that threshold about? What is, what's, the, what's the pain doing? What's the point? What is the point of pain? These are data, again, from Dan Harvey. Uh, this is in people with chronic neck pain where we uh, got them to wear a visual display unit. It's called an oculus. Uh, and showed a visual scene that we rotated at a different speed to the speed of rotation of their head. Does that make sense? So uh, they might be turning their head this far, but their visual field has moved as though they've gone further or not as far. In this experiment, this just shows that between a correction of about 75% and 120%, people can't tell that you're correcting it. They, they don't know that there's a mismatch there. We get people with neck pain, uh, and just that this is above the line and this is below the line tells us that the visual input is shifting the pain threshold to movement. So the onset of pain in people with chronic neck pain and pain on head rotation is better determined by the visual field than by something else, which is potentially very, uh, a very powerful observation. And the fact that pain comes on early tells us 
or raises the possibility that noxious input's not the trigger for that. But what's the pain doing then? I find that an interesting question. It's not just about pain. This is a, this is a cool study and I was reminded of this study this morning <coughs> because I had lunch uh, at the hotel I'm staying, breakfast at the hotel I'm staying at. Uh, beautiful breakfast and then I went into the lift to go up to my room to get my stuff ready. And a man came out of the list, lift <laughs> and he went like this. <coughs> had a bit of a smile on his face. I thought, that's a bit intriguing. I went in and I hit my floor number and the door shut. It was just disgusting. <laughs> and I thought, oh, come on, mate, that's bad. Got to my floor and I got out and someone else got in. <laughs> and she now, for the whole the rest of her life, will know that that person in the Belconnen United jumper <laughs> did something in the lift. This is a study where they gave supposedly normal healthy volunteers different odours while they were delivering noxious stimuli to their leg. Fun experiments, right? We're always looking for subjects for these things. Uh, this is the size, this is the size of the withdrawal reflect, reflex. So it's supposedly a, a segmental withdrawal. Dangerous message, pull your, your foot away. Uh, in a control situation, uh, in the presence of a pleasant odour, a neutral odour and an unpleasant odour. What I love about this is that our systems are sufficiently complex and sophisticated to upregulate general protection in the presence of a disgusting odour. <laughs> I reckon that's really, that's really cool, but clinically it's quite intimidating because now we're thinking, wow, all the things I have to consider even when I'm looking at motor control abnormalities. We have to consider, do we have to consider the olfactory system? And I would argue, well, we've got to consider the entire system. These are studies done by Sarah Woolwork, a PhD student in my group uh, as well, looking at a supposedly automatic reflex to make your eyes blink. So it's called the hand blink reflex. You stimulate the median nerve and you, you blink. Uh, and if you bring your hand, and, and it's been thought for a long time that that's a really simple loop, that you get the stimulus, it goes to the brainstem and the brainstem makes your eyes blink. But what Sarah and others have shown in the last three or four years is that if you bring your hand up close to your face, it's still going there, but now the blink's bigger. So your blink response is upregulated by the position of your hand. So something must be upregulating it. So what else determines the upregulation? This just shows a bigger response when your hand is near your face than when it's not. This shows a bigger response if your hand is still away but it's moving towards your face. So this is a predictive thing. Your brain is able to say, well, your hand's going to be there any second, so I'll give you a bigger protection. And it's smaller if your hand is close but you've started moving away, as though the brain says, no need. No need, we don't, know, we don't need to have a big response here because you're moving away anyway. So There's a feed-forward control system. If you stick a barrier between the hand and the, the face here, the response is back to normal. So knowing that you have a protective barrier means you don't upregulate your blink reflex. But if that barrier is made out of tissue paper, you do. Just think of how complex and cognitively mediated this must be that your brain is deciding in a split second should I increase eye protection here? What's the state of the barrier? And I think this has fundamental relevance to our treatment of people in pain who have ideas of the structure of their body, if you like, the vulnerability of their body, the fragility of their body. I think it's really relevant to the idea, the conceptual model that, uh, for those physios among you, I know there's a few, the transverse abdominis idea of a corset that holds you in. That's a beautiful cognitive model. So it might protect less when you've got your corset on or when you think you've got your corset on. This is data from Tasha Stanton, who's a postdoc in my group. Really cool device set up by a Canadian uh, biomechanist called Greg Korchuk. And it's a, it's a stiffness meter. So it pushes down on the lumbar spine and measures how stiff the lumbar spine is. And Tasha was really interested in whether feeling stiff I feel like I've got a stiff back. 
matches being stiff. And the first part of her experiment shows that it doesn't. Uh, there's no correlation between feeling stiff and true stiffness of the spine. But the groovy part was when she started combining the indentations of the back with different noises. And she either gave it a creaky door, <laughs> or a whooshing sound. This is what she found. Uh, this here shows that, that people feel less stiff if they're hearing the whooshy sound, and more stiff if they're hearing a creaky door. But the cool bit on the end of this is that if you start patients with low back pain and a feeling of stiffness off on the creaky door, and you slowly change the sound to the whoosh, they get up feeling less stiff and move forward more when they bend. <laughs> but if you do it the other way around, you do the opposite. Cool. I reckon that's cool anyway. These data here are, are suggesting a clinical implication. These data are from Kerwin Talbot and the difference between these lines here tell us that if you are not completely aware of which movements are the worst movements, this is done in hand pain, then you're likely to have pain on an expanding body of movements. And I'll say that again. If you haven't worked out which of your hand movements are the worst, are the most painful, or more to the point, which are painful and which are not, then you're likely to slowly develop pain on a range of movements around the truly painful one. This is called generalisation. And all of these studies are part of a program of research we've been working on for a few years based around a thing called the imprecision hypothesis, which is suggesting more and more that we need to start in acute pain presentations, teaching people clearly what's the worst movement and what's the, the not the, just the least, but what's not as bad. So their brain can encode what should I protect. One more of these sort of experiments uh, and then I'll move on from this. But this is a study, another study by Dan Harvey looking at what well, does it matter how, how precisely your brain can encode information? So we did a comparison between uh, stimuli coming from the hand where your encoding of tactile and other input is really precise uh, and compared that to the back where it's not very precise and it's not very surprising. The fact that these two lines have moved apart tells you what you would predict that the imperative to help people to establish the difference between what is really bad and what is not depends in part on the precision of the tissues of the body. So the back is less precise in its encoding, therefore we might need to be more careful with, with that step with people with back pain. The hand is very precise, so the brain is able to, to encode with a lot of precision. Well, what's the problematic movement here? And that's the movement from which I will protect you by making it hurt, if you like. I know there's problems with giving a persona to your brain that's different to you, but I hope that understands. So there's a fabulous opportunity, I think, with what the science is telling us about pain now. So, so we're rethinking pain completely, uh, not to be just about a danger message. So we used to think it was about a damage message. Then we thought, well, this is a danger message. Actually, it's a protect message. And there are, there are subtle but really important distinctions there. We can think of pain as a feeling <coughs> that's felt somewhere in the body that urges us to protect that body part. And if that's true, it means pain is dependent on the perceived need for and the benefit of protection. So in some situations of damage, the perceived benefit of protection might be nothing, so you don't hurt. So other situations where there's no damage, the perceived benefit of protecting from something might be high, so you hurt. So more and more we're thinking about pain as a protective feeling. And that gives us an opportunity clinically. We can have pain without any noxious input. These are data uh, from an American group where psychology students get credits for participating. Uh, and they got people to put their head in a sham stimulator. It doesn't do anything, but so long as the participant can see the intensity knob, <laughs> they get pain that matches the intensity knob. And the steepest of these lines is when the professor doesn't tell the PhD student who's doing the experiment that it's a sham. So the professor says, uh, so I just want you to be really careful with this head stimulator. Uh, if you see the eyes start to quiver, turn it off. 
we don't want to cause any damage. So when the, when the student, the researcher thinks, oh, I'm just putting a current through this guy's head, then the patient gets, the participant gets more, more pain. There's nothing happening. But there's a credible evidence that you need to protect. These are data from people with a condition called complex regional pain syndrome, which is a horrible condition. Uh, if we get them to put their hand behind a mirror and they're looking at their good hand and we touch their, they're looking at the reflection of their good hand and they touch their good hand, it hurts their bad hand. And we can map that area of, of allodynia very easily. So pain on touch, uh, very reliably, but there's no noxious input going in. It's a visual signal. So I always show these slides. Uh, I love these slides and I show these to all the patients uh, that I deal with in chronic pain groups. I do them in every talk just because I think they tell a really compelling story. Light reflects off the environment, hits the retina upside down, goes to the primary visual cortex, which flips the image and tells you what's happening. Right? Fair enough. It's wrong, it's not nearly that simple, and here's the proof, and I know some of you would have seen this before, but work with me on this. <coughs> Raise your hand if the square with A in it looks darker than the square with B in it. Canberra is neurologically intact. <laughs> That's great, but if we take them out to the side, you'll see that you're all wrong. They are exactly the same. And look what happens if you turn, better all turn your head the same way. Turn your head that way right over and get your eyes vertical with one another. <laughs> right over, nothing changes. <laughs> it still looks the same. But if you turned yourself upside down, you would still see that. So vision is not telling you what's hitting your retina. Vision is giving you an experience so that you can behave in appropriate way, interact with the world. What really happens, and I, I talk about this with patients, as a whole lot of groovy stuff really quickly, and we're trying to understand how that works. We just know that it does work at the moment. The same thing applies to pain. So if there's any uh, psychologists in the room, this is not right. Danger messages arrive at the brain, all this groovy stuff happens, and possibly pain emerges if there is perceived to be a good benefit of protection in this scenario. Is protective, protective behaviour going to help? Because the only way I can get you, the organism, to do something is to give you a feeling that makes you want to do it. And that principle applies right down to public health, right? You, people have got to want to do the thing. So we tend to group these things as though they're the same thing. Uh, nociception is activity in neurons, in the body and in the spinal cord. Pain is the thing you feel. And these behaviours are what you do about it. But we tend to talk about them in the same way and I feel really strongly that we should not. This is not helpful to mislabel these things. Pain is just one way the system can protect itself and as a physiotherapist we're very accustomed to other ways like movement. Uh, and for those of you who are not physiotherapists, time has come. This is a personal request from someone in the room. Physiotherapists have the best pelvic tilts in the universe. <laughs> <laughs> See that? I challenge any non-physiotherapist to reproduce that sort of quality. And you know when you have a patient with low back pain on your list, 20 years of low back pain, you just know they can't do the pelvic tilt. And you do your interview and you say, tell me about your pain. And they start talking, say, what, whatever, can you do the pelvic tilt? And they say, what? And you say, just the pelvic tilt. <laughs> and they go, can you do that again? It's just a pelvic tilt. The system stops working with precision in people with chronic back pain. In fact, you should go down to Garima Place after this and have a look for physios. <laughs> because they walk along like this. <laughs> They're just showing off all the time. So, so nociception is really important, but it's not essential. It's, it's not necessary. It's not sufficient. 
And there are many other cues of protection. The fabulous opportunity is that any credible evidence of danger is algesic, is promoting pain. Any credible evidence of safety is demoting pain or is analgesic. And there are many applications of this, including the model that you might have in your orthopedics department with your little swollen disc on it. And I would say, ask yourself, is that credible evidence of safety or danger? The model of the vertebral column with a disc that you haven't, you forgot to put back in. <laughs> and the patient walks past and their frontal lobe is looking around for credible evidence of safety and danger and sees that model. And the frontal lobe, sorry, I'm just going to take a moment out and just say, they are great socks, mate. <laughs> they are, can you just, just come out, just come out, come out here. That is very good. Well done. I'm not going to tell the rest of my story now because that was a better, better thing. In our clinical models, we talk about credible evidence of danger and, safe, danger and safety as DIMS, danger in me, and SIMS in a model that's very sophisticatedly known as the DIM-SIM model. <laughs> so, we know that persistent pain uh, is associated with upregulation of protection. And we know a lot about the changes that happen in nociception, so in the neural and neuroimmune mechanisms that send danger messages to the brain, and in the neural networks or the neuroimmune networks in your brain that actually subserve pain. We know they change, they learn, they just get better at doing their thing. That's a problem clinically because people with persistent pain are therefore overprotected. But unless they understand that, we're on a vicious downward cycle because the model is I'm over damaged, I'm more damaged. That's the model in the head. We know enough about pain now to say actually you're overprotected. We need other information to tell us about damage and true need to protect. So we know that really knowing that one is overprotected provides credible evidence of safety and how do we know that? Well because there's been what I would call and explain pain revolution that people have been explaining why that's the case for some time. And there's a lot of strategy behind that. Uh, what is explaining pain? Well, it's a, it's a range of educational interventions, conceptual change interventions. And it's easy for us because there's been a bad history of sort of back schools you know, to think, oh, education to behaviour change is like spaghetti to a brick. And the research shows that but not the last 10 years of research on explaining biology to change the conceptualization of pain. You can make it fun. You are allowed to draw things in physiology and neuroscience that are actually interesting to look at. <laughs> For example, this is cerebella. So cerebella is a cornerstone of a, of a therapeutic approach based on improving understanding of the biology of, of your pain. And if you look up close at her, you see some of the themes that come out that we want people to understand about their pain. So you've got a drug cabinet in your brain that's always available, even on public holidays. You can, you can tap into that. Discs never <coughs> slip. Ever. That's a really important message because the slip disc is part of our lexicon. And there's a good chunk of evidence. So there's now three meta-analyses looking at different aspects of the effects of this uh, in people with chronic pain of a range of diagnoses, and the effects are good. Now, the effect sizes are typical. They're sort of 0.7 to 1.2, uh, and it's not meant to be just something you do and leave. The main, the main effect of people understanding their pain is that they participate in a sensible, biopsychosocially based physical upgrading program. Their body's not going to get fitter and stronger just by providing information. So we, we really want to get people to participate in sensible rehab. These are audit data. So this is from 407 patients uh, and we got 92% follow-up at one year from this group from seven different clinics in three different countries. This is their pain at presentation on average and standard deviation, two weeks, six weeks, three months and one year. 
for the people who in the first two weeks change their understanding of pain biology. We measure that with a questionnaire uh, and interactive interview. This is the trajectory of pain in the people who, who didn't show a change in that first two weeks in their understanding of pain biology there. And hopefully you agree that's pretty compelling that if we can change the, the trajectory of the meteor in that early stage just a bit, then by a year later, people are having what's actually good results. This affects, now this is not an RCT, so this is really important. This is not a randomised controlled trial. This is audit data, and audit data are always better than RCTs uh, as a rule. So uh, we can't say effect sizes here comparing to something, but an effect size of time here is two and a half, three. That's, that's something to be excited about. I just put this in as I was listening to one of the talks this morning, uh, the suicide talk, I don't know if you're here, uh, but the, the feeling that clinicians had about, I just had a feeling, I think it was that sort of thing, and they were nervous about saying that. It's not evidence-based or anything, but I just had a feeling this person would do well or not. We asked every clinician in this cohort uh, after their first explained pain session, how well did you connect? And then we correlated their rating of connectedness with the change in pain. And hopefully you can see this is a decent correlation. The problem with this is we don't know what connectedness really is. But if you feel like you've connected, that's a really good sign. It's a bad sign that some clinicians rated their extent of connectedness as minus two. <laughs> so this is the patient-friendly version of trying to understand, well, what are your dims, the danger in me? What are your sims, evidence of safety in me? and stick them into an internal protector meter or protection meter because that's the thing that triggers your protective responses, one of which, the big kahuna of which, is pain. And sims hide and dims hide in very hard to spot places. For example, reading that interest rates are going up again and this asterisk here alerts the reader to something that says, really, how could this be related to my pain? Well, read on, it should be. If it's providing credible evidence that you are under threat, we know some of the immune mechanisms involved in that mean that if you're under general threat, your specific bodily threat increases. And we understand that biologically now. We didn't five years ago, and now we do. So we like people to ask all of these questions. Where are the dims and the sims for you in the things that you hear, see, smell, taste, touch? the things you do, the things you say. How many of your patients with back pain say, I've got a dodgy back? I don't really expect you to answer that question now that I've heard myself say that. Like, I don't want you to say 13. <laughs> I mean, how, isn't it common that people say, I've got a dodgy back? And we ask them, oh, how's your back? I have a friend who's got back pain. Uh, and I always say to her when I see her, how's your back pain? And she said, oh, my back's really dodgy. So, oh, and, and how's your back pain? What, what do you mean? Well, I'm, I don't, how do you know your back's dodgy? I've got back pain. Oh, that's the thing I'm interested in. Because now we know back pain and dodgy back, they're not that well related actually anymore, especially if you've had pain for two and a half years. So, that's, so every time you say, I've got a slip disc, then you have to run brain cells that hold that, that interact with protective mechanisms. So I say to patients, don't say it. And when you hear it, correct the person. You can't slip a disc, ever. There are also a range of perceptual and physiological disturbances that occur when pain persists, which become dims. And we now know they become dims. And I'll, I'll go through this quickly, because uh, I just think it's sort of really interesting. But it's focusing a lot on this condition called complex regional pain syndrome. So uh, here's a situation of a left uh, left hand starting with uh, probably a radial head fracture. Uh, this, I think, started with an ingrown toenail. Uh, it's horrible. It, uh, by all reports, feels as bad as it looks. Uh, and the limb is rendered useless, really, um, but still intact and very painful. It's not trivial. There's 5,000 new Australians... Uh, no, there's 5,000 Australians who get this each year. Treatment costs about 12k a year and our success rate of getting them out of CRPS inside a year is around about 
So it's a, it's a really difficult problem. We're interested in a lot of their behaviours look like neglect. So we did this experiment where we got people with upper limb CRPS and we gave them two stimuli, exactly the same, to the same place on their hand at slightly different times. So if, if we were doing an auditory version of this, it would be like that. Is that okay? Tap, tap. Or the other way around. And the job that the participant has is to tell us which stimulus occurred first. And when we do a lot of those tests, we end up with a picture like this. And if, if their processing was normal side to side, all of those lines would cross at the cross here. The fact that they're all shifted to the right tells us that the information coming from their affected side, so that's a tactile input, it doesn't cause pain, so tactile input is less influential over perception than the same input from the other side. I'll say that again. The tactile input from their bad hand is less influential on their brain than the tactile input from their good hand. And this is what we see in unilateral spatial neglect after a stroke. Now the effects are a lot bigger after a stroke than they are here. What we got these people to do is cross their hands over the midline and repeated it and now it's reversed. So actually this is not about tactile input from the painful hand, it's about tactile, tactile input from the painful side of space. Because when they shift their hands around, the effect goes with location, not with hand. In this experiment, we thought, well, is it just about CRPS or maybe it's about back pain? So we, we searched far and wide to find really athletic bodies and we drew lines on their back. <laughs> and they all had a very small, that, that's a very small bottom, isn't it? <laughs> that's like, really, could you poo out of that? That's very small. Anyway, let's say these people had unilateral back pain, chronic unilateral back pain. We, got, uh, we put these tactile stimulators on their back and repeated the experiment. But we also got them to hold the stimulators in their hand and put their hands near their back. So now the pathway is a hand pathway up to the brain, not a back pathway. And we repeated the experiment. There's a lot of data, there are three experiments in this, I'll just tell you the interesting bit. So this shows that the same thing is happening in people with low back pain when the stimulus is on their back. Their, their results are all shifted to the right of the midline. This is when they put the stimulators in their hands and we replicate the effect. This is in controls. So the fact that we've replicated the effect with your hands here and in another experiment with your hands like this shows us quite clearly that the brain is allocating influence away from the space, not the area of the back, the space. And I've had patients with chronic unilateral back and leg pain, classic sciatica, and we do an experiment where I just, I just click a little, uh, it's like a pen clicker, soft clicking noise, and just say, point to where you hear the click. And I've had patients where I, I click right near their painful area and they just don't hear it. Keep going. I'm saying, have you stopped? So no. And then I tell them, okay, I'm clicking near, near your back. Click it, and they point to it straight away. So we can engage that system really quickly. But on its own, that space is like the brain has said, no, not interested. And, and there are real life changes in functional properties of neuroimmune networks that explain that uh, and that form the models of our, of our current approaches. And to finish up with, uh, I want to present what I think is pretty compelling evidence that this is not just about touch and pain, it's also about autonomic control, blood flow regulation. In CRPS, people with chronic CRPS often have a very cold limb. So it goes through this really angry hot phase and then it becomes cold. And this is the temperature difference in this experiment between the healthy limb and the, the affected limb. And this is what happens after they cross their hands for 10 minutes. So the affected limb warms up and the healthy limb cools down. This is in a separate experiment with a separate group of people. Put both of the hands on the uh, healthy side and they're both warm. And you put both of them on the unhealthy or the affected side and they're both cool. And this process takes 10 minutes or so for this to occur. 
give them prism glasses so it looks like their hand has crossed the midline. So they get the illusion that their hand's over there. And we replicate the effect even though the hand is not with both sides. So this is not about where the hand is. This is about where the brain is mapping the hand on its spatial map. And the brain changes blood flow according to that. It's a dear friend of mine who works at King's College London, did his PhD under a guy called Patrick Wall of Melzack and Wall Gate Control Theory. And he follows up statements like that with a statement that I think is really, really poignant. This complexity, this fearful and wonderful complexity. How hard is your job? How hard does your job become? Trying to make sense of, of protective outputs like pain, like movement, like other protective outputs. And the, the conclusion I draw from this is we are ridiculously, fearfully, wonderfully complex. Uh, and we're really letting go of those ideas of the, of the body as a machine. It's got machine-like characteristics, for sure. But it's really more like a garden. Something goes wrong with the tomatoes and all of a sudden the Brussels sprouts are going well. And there's all sorts of cross-pollination and the soil's relevant and the sun's in shade and they're all affecting each other. It's not a, it's, we're just not a system of pulleys and pipes and wires. It's extremely complex. There's a the last study I'm, I'm going to mention and this is looking again at this idea of somatospatial neglect. So, when you give people with CRPS a line and say, tell me the middle of that line, they get it right every time. So they don't have a spatial problem. There's no neglect of space. But if you draw the line on their hand, they get it wrong. And these data just show that, that if, they, if you have a, a hand in front of them like this and they try to bisect it, they get it right. But if you shift the hand around to be in this direction, they try and bisect it, they get it wrong. And it only happens if, if it's drawn on a body part. So this type of neglect, if you like, is about mapping the body onto space. It's not about space per se. That's my time up. I'd like to say thank you again to Charm. Congratulations on this meeting. It's, it's an inspiration for us in other cities to try and get something like this going. It's really good. And I've looked at the other years. Pretty amazing uh, a group of, of speakers. And I looked at tomorrow. The fellow talking tomorrow writes a paper every nine hours. <laughs> that's, that's true. He's it's written a paper every nine hours. I get one out about once every two weeks, and I think some people are impressed by my performance, but that's, that's astounding. So congrats. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for coming. I appreciate that it's a, a school day. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. did not disappoint. Phew. Thank you so much for coming and talking to us. It gives me no pleasure to say we have no time for questions, but Sorry. it Very does well give planned. me pleasure to say it's lunchtime and you're being fed and will be available for questions. Is that, would that be right? Absolutely. Yeah, cool. So, um, oh, she's disappeared. Okay. Uh, one question <laughs> until Hannah gets back. Oh, there she is. Sorry. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> so Hannah would like to present you with a small gift in Thanks for your efforts and brilliance. Thank you, my friend. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks very much. It's very heavy. Oh, cool. Not even alcohol, either. <laughs> right. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Can I show people how well it's wrapped? Because yeah. often these things, you know, they're not wrapped. Oh. <laughs> Can we get the wrapper to stand up? That is very... <laughs> you yeah. Sorry. Thank you all very much. Thanks Lunch all. time now. Next session, Thanks. do come back for the afternoon session. Thank you. It's nice of you. Thanks a lot.